We're going to start with the Fatha. This is going to be a halaqa on commentaries on parts of the Quran. Hopefully, we will get an opportunity to cover by the end of the halaqa the majority of the Quran, if not all of it. Our point is to emphasize various discourses on various aspects of the Quran. This is not a halaqa on law, so nothing we talk about should be understood to or equated with the position of Islamic law on something or another. In other words, we are simply talking about the Quran, we're not adding in the factor of hadith or sunnah, and we are not adding in the factor of the practice of the companions, or the practices of people in Medina, or the practices of the Tabi'een, the successors to the Prophet. So consequently, or customs, or consensus, or whatever, so con- consequently do not equate between simply what we say about the, the Quranic verse, the ayat, and what Sharia's position is. An important distinction that should become more and more apparent to you, inshallah, as we go on. I chose the Qur'an, although normally I always choose the Sharia, but I chose the Qur'an because that's where it all began. And it seems to me that often where it all began is missed by uh, many of us, or by all of us, in fact, today. It becomes very attractive to jump to the comfort of much writing. In other words, the comfort of Islamic law books or the comfort of hadith. And not give the necessary attention to the text where it all began. We miss something very important there. And we miss the the taste of the original spirit. The original enlightenment, the original spark that must have touched the very early Muslims before there were any law books or before there were any volumes and volumes of traditions and so on. It was all the spark of that single book. And we miss quite a bit when we are unable to feel that spark in anything approximating the the same way. Okay. Oh, uh, another thing. Do not tell people about this halakha. If you think if you think there is a person that should be invited to attend, because you personally think that this is a person who is mature, responsible, committed, pious. The most important aspect is not that they have a lot of enthusiasm. I don't care about that. A lot of people are very enthusiastic, but they're morons at the same time. The most important thing is maturity. The more a person, the the more quiet a person, the less a person says about religion, that's a person you should keep in mind. That's a person you should notice. Because then that person presumes ignorance about himself or herself. And that's the type of person that is good raw material for knowledge. A person who feels ignorant. A person who feels knowledgeable. That's usually the worst type of wrong tale because you have to spend time breaking their ego before you start teaching them anything. In other words, you have to spend time convincing them they're ignorant and then you start teaching them. It's a very long and tedious process. No, the best, the, the best person is the person you sort of notice that they already presume they're ignorant and their knowledge is higher than what they think it is. And then that type of person, if you notice that type of person, you may suggest them and somehow I might try to talk to them, and then if it found appropriate, would be invited. But other than that, don't don't invite people to to uh, attend. Al Fatiha. The good thing about Al Fatiha is all of us know it. So it makes it easier. Bismillah rahman rahim that's the beginning of the Fatiha. 
Al Fatiha means the opening. Comes from the word Fatiha, to open. Fatih could also be a spark of enlightenment. So it is an opening towards something that by definition is positive. So when we talk about the Islamic military conquests, what do we call them? Al-Futuhat. Why do we call them Al-Futuhat? Because we consider that these military conquests are what opened these countries or these nations or these states to something positive. What is that positive thing? Islam, right? Consequently, we call them the Futuhat. When Ibn Arabi wrote his book, talking about the sparks of enlightenment that Ibn Arabi argued he received from Allah, he called it Al-Futuhat al makkiyya the sparks of enlightenment. Makkiyya because he said he received them in Mecca. Consequently, the word Fataha implies something positive and implies enlightenment. And how appropriate is it for this surah to be called Al-Fatiha, the opening. The implication is that this is the key to the Quran. But reflect upon this for a second, the key to the Quran. Does it then give you essentially what the balance of the Quran will lay out to you specifically? Does it give you generally what the balance of the Quran is going to lay out specifically? Is it in fact the capsulization of the spirit of the Quran? In fact, this is the way the Fatiha has been perceived and read and discussed. The interesting thing though about it is the question of when was it revealed? Before commenting on that, let me say that the Fatiha also has three other names. Anyone know what the, the three other names are? Fatiha al Kitab is one of its names, called Fatiha al Kitab, the opening of the book. Umm al Quran. What does Umm al Quran mean? Mother book. Or Umm al Kitab, the mother of. The, the mother of the Quran or the mother of the book? Umm al-Kitab, also known as As-Sab al-Mathani. As-Sab al-Mathani because it's seven verses. Al-Mathani, Mathani means the wisdom. The seven pearls of wisdom. So, known as Fatiha al-Kitab, Umm al-Kitab, or Umm al-Quran, and As-Sab al-Mathani. You should know that some jurists considered it unacceptable for people to refer to the Fatiha as is Sab al-Mathani or Umm al-Quran. The majority view, however, is that not only is it acceptable, but it is actually um, <coughs> recommended. So, if the Fatiha is the essential nutshell spirit of the full book, the key to the Quran, when was it revealed? When did it come about? There is much debate and discourse on that. The majority, the most famous is the, is the famous transmitter or authenticator of the Quran, Qutada is his name, said that the Fatiha is surely Meccan. It was revealed in Mecca. Strangely enough, is Zuhari wa Ata and Mujahid this is uh, the manuscript that I have in, in the bed, in, in the den that I showed some of you. This huge, remember this huge Xerox manuscript thing? You know what I, sh I showed you? It's black, hard cover, and it's huge Xerox. Yeah. This is by Mujahid. That's the Mujahid. That's the text of Mujahid. Mujahid said it was revealed in Medina. Why is it a problem if we say if it, it, that it was revealed in Medina? Z Zuhari. And Mujahid and Atah said that it was revealed in Medina. 
It's a problem because then what were the Muslims reciting when they were praying in Mecca for over 10 years? Right? Two, why would be the opening of the book be revealed in, only in Medina? In my view, and this is my view, that it was revealed in Mecca. That the argument that it was revealed in Medina, or the reports that it was revealed in Medina, come from a misunderstanding, and again, I emphasize, this is my view, and I very carefully distinguish to you when I'm telling you my view, as opposed to the simply reporting on the view of others. That we have reports that the Fatiha was revealed in Mecca, Mutawatir reports that it was revealed in Mecca, but we also have reports that it was revealed in Medina. Why should we exclude the possibility that it was revealed both in Mecca and Medina? Why couldn't it be the case that considering the importance of the Fatiha, that the Prophet received the transmission once and Jibreel came again with the same transmission to emphasize its importance, especially that the reports that it was revealed in Medina say it happened right after the Hijrah. Why should we exclude the possibility that it happened shortly after the Prophet became a Prophet and again after the Hijrah to emphasize the importance of the, of the Surah? I think that explains the conflict between the reports of Qutada and the, and the, the majority and the reports of reliable people like Zuhri and Ata and Mujahid. Now, have I found any support for my opinion? I have found one jurist or one Quranic commentator who suggested a similar possibility. Uh, uh, I came to that determination first, then I found that support, and consequently I was encouraged that it might have something behind it, that it might not be completely off the wall. This is particularly the case that there is another debate about the Fatiha. And that is, among the majority, the majority says it was revealed in Mecca. Okay. Was it the first revelation or not the first revelation? All of you have heard that the first revelation was what? Iqra. In fact, this is the majority view. However, there are several reports that it was, revu it was revealed before Al-Muddathir and before Iqra. That in fact that it is the first revelation. The report goes something like this. That the Prophet والسلام, came to Khadijah and told her, I am extremely troubled because I hear a voice calling out, Ya Muhammad, Ya Muhammad. Khadijah, and he says, I fear that I am losing my mind. Khadijah responds by saying, you are the sanest person on the face of the earth. You are not losing my mind, not, not losing your mind. Abu Bakr walks in a day later and Khadijah tells Abu Bakr this, this matter. Abu Bakr then says, let us go and see who is Khadijah's cousin, um, what was his name? Warak, Warak ibn Nufal. Let us go and see Warak ibn Nufal and tell him about this. Abu Bakr goes to the Prophet and says, I heard such and such. The Prophet says, who told you? He says, Khadijah told me. He said, okay, let's go see Warak. They go to Waraka, and Waraka says, What is it that you hear? He says, I hear a voice saying, Ya Muhammad, Ya Muhammad. 
He says, well, I, when you hear this voice next time, don't run away. Because the Prophet tells Khadija that I hear the voice and I run away. Don't run away. Stand where you are. The Prophet hears the voice again. He stands where he is. Then he receives the Fatiha as the first revelation. Now, immediately you should notice several problematic points about this report. Although it has a very good chain of transmission, and although that you will find this report in Bukhari and Muslim and several of the others, one, what's something that's extremely peculiar about it? Who suggests that they go see Warak? Abu Bakr, right? Abu Bakr is in the picture before he converts to Islam. I mean, if this is the first revelation, there's nothing to convert to. Am I right? So is it that Abu Bakr was friends with the Prophet and Khadija before Islam? If that's the case, then the story might be more believable. But we don't know. I mean, we can't establish a friendship between Abu Bakr and the Prophet and his wife before there's Islam. The second peculiar thing is this idea of Waraka telling the Prophet, okay, when you hear the voice, stand where you are, don't run away. Could it be that the revelation would be held up simply on something as simple as whether you stand in your place or run away? Third, why is it the Abu Bakr that suggests that they go see Waraka when he is Khadija's cousin? In other words, Waraka is Khadija's cousin. What's Abu Bakr's relationship to Waraka for him to suggest that they go see Waraka and to ask him? All of these things, despite of the fact that this report has a strong chain of transmission, rendered the report questionable, suspect. And consequently, the majority view developed that al muddathir and Iqra came before the Fatah. However, you should know that several commentators, several famous commentators, rejected the idea that anything was revealed before the Fatiha because they said, how could the Fatiha be the mother of the book and not come first? I personally tend my own feeling or my own view, it could be the mother of the book and not be the first revelation. In other words, I could call your attention to something and say, for example, Ya Jihad, come, I want to tell you something. Now that I have your attention, I tell you something really important. Majority opinion that the Fatiha must be read in every rakah. In other words, when you pray, you read the Fatiha every rakah. However, there was a debate up to the 3rd century. Kufan jurists particularly said that the Fatiha is not a requirement in every rak'ah, that only that you read a segment from the Qur'an. Al-Hasan al-Basri said that you read the Fatiha once in prayer. Both views also reported and it is a remarkable thing, by the way. I, you must notice this. You must notice this. Nowadays, Muslims never report anything that's different. In other words, you will never, ever, ever, ever go to a mosque in the United States and find an imam telling you anything that you don't already know. In fact, if he tells you anything that you don't already know, you suspect he's making it up. We have become very boring people, to say the least extremely boring people. It is remarkable that when you open up a pre-modern text on, a, in, on Islam, you find that they report even something like this without 
being threatened by it. They might disagree with it, and they do, but you will take a source like any source, any source, and find that they report something like this without it being a shocker to them. I think it tells you a lot about the value of discourses, pre-modern and modern. And I think it also tells you a lot about the discrepancy between modern Islam in the United States particularly, and I don't want to generalize as to Islam everywhere, because it's not as bad as it is here elsewhere, and pre-modern Islamic discourses. If you go in a, in, a, in, a, in a mosque and you make a point like this and say Hassan al-Basri said that the Fatha would be read one time in prayer, you would have a rebellion on your hand. But yet you cannot pick up a pre-modern tafsir without it mentioning this point, without the books being burned and destroyed or whatever. Nonetheless, having said this, in my own view, that both the Kuvin view and the Basrian view are incorrect. And in my own view, there seems to have been confusion as to the, the evidence cited, both by the Kufans and the Basrians, is that they had not heard the Prophet recite the Fatiha in certain prayers. But what they cite as evidence for prayer is suspect. We have one report, for example, that they saw the Prophet sitting down, reading a part of the Qur'an than doing sujood. But that's not prayer. He's, he's sitting down in, in uh, Salat Ibrahimiya Ibrahim, format. What do you call that in English? Yeah, when you have your legs under your... your huh? Yeah, when you like sitting down like this. You know. Okay, and he's reading part of the Qur'an. That's not prayer, right? Because if he's reading part of the Quran, he would be what? If it's in prayer, he'd be standing up. He'd be standing up, not sitting like this. So, anyway, you know it's there.